we will be discussing ultrasound guided lumbar puncture. Mofidi and others 2013 performed a prospective randomized trial with 80 patients at a single center. Under supervision, three PGY3 EM residents with two hours of relevant ultrasound training performed lumbar punctures with static ultrasound guidance versus the more traditional landmark-based approach. Of note, the patients were all in lateral decubitus disposition. They found that the ultrasound group was faster and had fewer traumatic taps. Interestingly, the patients assigned to the ultrasound group also reported lower pain scores. These findings were, particularly, were larger at higher BMIs. Let's briefly go over a systematic review. Gottlieb et al. 2018 performed a meta-analysis of 12 studies, including the study um, Mofidi performed with others in 2013, which we reviewed in the previous slide. With a total of 956 patients undergoing LP in several countries by a variety of clinicians, primarily uh, EM-trained physicians and residents in the emergency department. The combined analysis of the relevant data showed small but statistically significant fewer failed attempts, fewer traumatic taps, fewer needle passes, less time, and lower pain scores. The risk difference, A, and the odds ratio, B, for success rate for all studies is pictured here. Subgroup analysis of pediatric and adult patients in isolation did demonstrate that ultrasound reduces the number of traumatic taps for both groups, but it failed to re-demonstrate statistical significance for procedural success, although the ultrasound group was still favored. Furthermore, as Kirshner and Hunter 2019 point out, the study participants likely had a special interest in ultrasonography, and hence the generalizability of the data is unclear. Furthermore, the time to set up the ultrasound was not measured. Although it could be argued the time spent with a needle in the skin is a more clinically important measure to patients. The contraindications, as well as the diagnostic and therapeutic indications for using lumbar puncture in a patient are listed here. The indications for using ultrasonography include difficult landmarks, high BMI, and abnormal anatomy, although there may be benefit for using ultrasound guidance in any patient. A schematic of the relevant anatomy for a lumbar puncture is pictured on this slide. As you can see, the needle punctures through the skin, subcutaneous tissue, supraspinous ligament, interspinous ligament, then the ligamentum flavum, then the epidural space, which contains the internal vertebral venous plexus, the dura, and the arachnoid, and finally the subarachnoid space where we will um, get CSF. This is our goal. Using static ultrasound guidance, we will identify relevant anatomy and mark the skin as pictured here. We will then put the probe down, clean the, and drape the patient, and insert our needle where X marks the spot here in the L4, L5 interspace. But how do we get to this point? We will begin our procedure by positioning the patient, either in the lateral recumbent or sitting position as pictured here. For infants, the lateral recumbent with the back hyperflexed is generally preferred, and in adults, when tolerated, the sitting position is generally preferred. We will then select a transducer. You can use either the linear or cur curvilinear probe. The linear probe, although it does provide higher resolution, its depth may not be adequate for some patients. This narrator prefers the curvilinear probe for adult patients to give a more bird's eye view of the anatomy and the linear probe for pediatric patients. We will next briefly orient ourselves to the patient's anatomy. You can look at the iliac crests, which are generally the same level as L4. In a patient where you're not able to palpate the iliac crest, an ultrasound probe is sufficient. You can also directly look at the sacrum using the ultrasound which is just below L5. Next, we will identify the midline. We will put our probe transverse with the indicator pointing towards the patient's left. The probe will go over directly over the L5 spinous process. You'll mark the skin at the center of the probe to identify midline. Move up one spinous process to the L4 spinous process and repeat. You can then connect the dots. Pictured here is a midline transverse view of the L5 spinous process seen here in the lamina. Paraspinal muscles are just above the lamina. This image is also in the transverse plane. It is in between the spinous process of L4 and L5. It is the intervertebral space. This is where we will insert our needle. Next, we will identify the intervertebral space. Using the probe in the vertical orientation with the probe indicator towards the patient's head, we will look for relevant anatomy. Here we can see in the picture above the sacrum on the right side of the screen, the L5 spinous process, and then the L4 spinous process. You will mark a transverse horizontal line indicating the interspinous space of L3 and L4 and L4, L5, ideally. Our vertical and horizontal lines should then intersect, and where X marks the spot, we will insert our needle. 
If the first attempt at the L4, L5 interspace were to fail, it would be ideal to have a backup at the L3, L4 interspace. So the forward-thinking proceduralist would ideally mark off both the L3, L4 interspace and the L4, L5 interspace. Before we put our probe down, we will identify the depth of the ligamentum flavum and choose a needle of the appropriate length to make sure that we have adequate penetration to get to the subarachnoid space. Here, we would need a needle, um, the ligamentum flavum is about four centimeters. We would need a needle of the appropriate depth. Here, as you can see, the ligamentum flavum uh, in this patient is about six centimeters. We would need a needle of the appropriate depth. In this patient, a little larger, we would need a needle of about nine centimeters. The information on this slide was taken directly from Wiki EM. It contains the information, the clinical information gathered from the four tubes in the lumbar puncture. This table was taken directly from Wiki EM. It reviews characteristic CSF findings of common pathologies. As with all ultrasound guided procedures, it's important to actually plug in the ultrasound before starting, as losing power halfway through would not be ideal. It's also important before you even begin to have all the equipment and personnel you will need at the bedside to ensure a smooth and quick process. Before you begin, it's important to ensure that the patient is positioned in a comfortable and appropriately flexed way so that they won't move during the procedure, as doing so can throw off your landmarks a little bit. Using ultrasound, it's important to ensure that you are midline, as fanning one way or the other or sliding one way or the other can easily throw you off midline which can cause you to mark landmarks that really aren't there or are slightly off to the side. It's also important to consider marking off the L3, L4 interspace in addition to the L4, L5 interspace before attempting puncture of the L4, L5 interspace. And if that's unsuccessful, then move up to attempting puncture of the L3, L4 interspace. It's also important to remember that the neonatal spinal cord ends at L3. Consider marking off the L5, S1, and L4, L5 interspaces in these patients. And with all things, if you're not able to see the anatomy or if you do attempt a lumbar puncture and you're not successful, if it's clinically indicated, consider fluoroscopic guidance. As always, it's important to be on the lookout for complications. In conclusion, static ultrasound guidance can be used to identify relevant LP anatomy, including depth, which can be used to identify which needle we need to use. There are potential benefits using ultrasound guidance for all patients, including fewer traumatic taps, increased procedural success rate, fewer needle redirections, and less pain. But the use, use of ultrasound is generally reserved for patients with large BMIs and difficult anatomies. And with lumbar puncture in general, it's important that we don't let this step prevent us from treating the patient in front of us. If a patient needs antibiotics, for example, for sus suspected meningitis, they should be administered without delay. What do you use the curve linear probe to identify the superior iliac crest. Make a small mark in the center of that. The L3, L4 vertebral interspin should be roughly parallel. We'll begin scanning first in the longitudinal axis to identify the landmarks. You see the inner vertebral spaces here. The spinous process here, here, and here. So it's L3, L4, L5, likely. Um, we'll then turn our indicator probe um, in the transverse frame, plane with the indicator pointed to the patient's left. Look at the uh, spinous process, uh, the L4 spinous process in the center of the screen. We'll make a small, small dot. And then move down one interspace to the next spinous process. Make a second dot. We'll then connect the two lines. And then we'll go back to the transverse axis and we'll look, at, look for the intervertebral space. That's right there. That center. And we'll create a horizontal line there. So the intersection should be the space where we'll or needle coming to the patient's foot level. Slightly, slightly elevated. And we'll look for the ligaments and flavum in the interspace process, and it looks like it's 9 centimeters down. We'll get a 
I'd meet up with a length of time, at least 10 centimeters. We have here a bonus meta-analysis with similar findings to the Gottlieb analysis described earlier.